Welcome to our online service. We are so glad you can join us. May the word of God speak to you. May you understand and also embrace the love of God for each and every one of you. Uh, please join me for a word of opening prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for not only loving us, but for demonstrating your love for us through your Son, Jesus Christ, that through him, we not only have forgiveness, but that we have a relationship with you. As we worship you this morning, as we hear your holy word, we ask that you will remind us of your holy presence, that you would strengthen us, that you would build, us, build up our faith, that we may live each and every day in joy and peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We begin this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On my heart imprint your image, blessed Jesus, King of grace, that life's riches, cares, and pleasures never may your work erase. Let the clear inscription be Jesus crucified for me. Is my life my hope foundation and my glory and salvation? On my heart imprint your image, blessed Jesus, King of grace, that life's riches, cares, and pleasures never may your work erase. Let the clear inscription be Jesus crucified for me. Is my life my hope foundation? and my glory and salvation. Please join me for confession and absolution. Heavenly Father, at times we feel so frail and fragile. Getting blown about by the latest crisis by bad news, by our own short tempers and failings. You call us to hold fast what is good, but so often we flounder, unable to find a solid thing that will center us again. Help us, we pray. Help us to see you as our center and to cling to the good that you create in the world. Help us to set aside all our jealousies and prejudices all of our betrayals and lies, all that adds to the world's hurt. Help us to grow even more into Christ's likeness, that we will bear his love and truth to the world. We pray all this in his name. Upon this, your confession, I bow virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Took a day. 
First reading is recorded in the 21st chapter of Numbers, beginning at the fourth verse. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. And the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and he put it up on a pole. And then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Ephesians, the second chapter, beginning at the first verse. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you had lived when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is recorded in St. John, the third chapter, beginning at the 14th verse. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We're so glad you can join us today. I pray that God's word will speak to to you. Now, one time there was a young man and he came across a woman. It was like love at first sight. I mean, he instantly fell for her. And so at that moment, he didn't know what to do. They seemed to have some chemistry, and so he decided to ask his mother. He told, hey mom, there's this girl that I just met. I'm head over heels for her. What should I do? Well, his mother suggested, why don't you buy her some flowers? And then with the flowers, enclose a card and in the card, invite her over to your place 
for a homemade dinner. And so he, he, so he sounded really excited and he decided to execute the plan. So he bought her some flowers and on the card wrote, uh, please come over to my place for a homemade meal. Well, this one week later, this all happened and his mother was curious about what happened. So she calls the son up, hey son, what happened? How was the date? Well, he said, well, it was a disaster. Well, what happened? Did she come over? She said, oh, she did, she did come over, but she refused to cook. <laughs> yes, this morning's sermon is about love. Now, last week, I talked about that verse. Um, uh, it was in 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. So the more we understand the love of God, when the love of God permeates more than head knowledge and becomes heart knowledge, the more we understand and grow in the knowledge of the love of God, our fears begin to be lessened. And, and as we understand this more, the fears begin to disappear. Um, 1 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. This morning, I want to continue to talk about God's love. And in our gospel lesson this morning, uh, we have the most famous verse. Some people call it the gospel in a nutshell or the center of the entire Bible, which is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now this leads to my first point. God's love for you is unconditional. For God so loved, that word loved in the Greek, the word loved for, for in the Greek, there's four words for love in the Bible. Now the first one is... Um, the first one is eros, which is where we get the word romantic uh, in nature, um, romantic love, which is reserved for, for marriage. And then we also have the second word, stor st st storge. It means family love, fam a love between parent and child, brother and sister. And then there's the third word for love in the Greek is phylos is where we get brotherly love. It's where we get the word, uh, the name Philadelphia, which means the city of brotherly love. And then the highest form is what is used in this verse. For God so love, the word is agape. It is the highest, purest form of love called unconditional love. So for God so unconditionally love the world. Now the world, this word here, we're familiar with it because in the Greek, it's the word cosmos. But in the Greek, the word cosmos is defined as the ungodly multitude, the whole mass of men alienated from God and therefore hostile to the cause of Christ. So here, for God so unconditionally love this world that is hostile to him, that he loves us so much that he gave us his son. So here you see a God that loves all of us universally, every single person on, the planet, uh, on this planet, unconditionally. God's love is universal. God's love is unconditional. Many years ago, there was a um, conference a, a conference on, um, it's called Comparative Religions. Now, they were talking amongst them, these scholars, about different religions, and a topic came up. What makes Christianity unique? Well, one person said, the incarnation. God became one of us and lived among us. Well, another person objected. Well, Christianity is not the only one that has that concept about a God becoming human. We have that in other religions as well. Then another person pointed out, no, 
It's the resurrection, how Jesus rose from the dead. And then another person pointed out, well, well, someone coming back from the dead is not new either. We see that in other religions as well. And so they kept going back and forth. They, they kept debating. And then C.S. Lewis, he walks into the room. Apparently, he was scheduled to speak. So he comes in a few minutes early, has a stack of papers. Um, because he was early, he decided to sit down and listen to conversation. Now, debate started getting heated over what makes Christianity unique. And then he said, what is the rumpus? And people turned to him, and they said, we're debating what's unique about Christianity. Then he said, oh, that's easy. It's grace. The room fell silent. Lewis continued. He says, God, God's love comes free of charge. No strings attached. No other religion makes that claim. Wow. Lewis had a point there. As they thought about it, they thought about different religions. Well, the Buddhists, they have an eightfold path to enlightenment. It's not a free ride. The Hindus believe in karma. So your action continually affects the world around you. Okay. And then there's the Jewish laws and codes. God's requirements for his people. And then you have Islam, who believes that God, their God is a God of judgment, and you need to live righteously to appease him. At the end of the conference, they all realize a point, that only Christianity proclaims that God's love is unconditional. Philip Yancey, um, the author, uh, he wrote a book called um, What's... What's amazing about grace? This is what he said, quote, there is nothing we can do to make God love us more. There's nothing we can do to make God love us less. Wow. There's nothing you can do to make God love you any more than he loves you right now. There's nothing you can do to make God love you any less. Even if you behave terribly, even if you've made mistakes, there's nothing you can make God to love you more. There's nothing you can make to do to make God love you less. Max Lucado, um, pastor and author of many books, he writes, there are many reasons God saves you to bring glory to himself, to appease his justice, to demonstrate his sovereignty. But one of the sweetest reasons God saved you is because he is fond of you. He likes having you around. Isn't that cool? He likes having you around, okay? He thinks you are the best thing to come down to Pike in quite a while. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If he had a wallet, your photo would be in it. Or if he had a smartphone, your picture would be in it. That's me, I added that. He sends you flowers every spring and every sunrise every morning. Whenever you want to talk, he'll listen. He can live anywhere in the universe and he chose your heart. And the Christmas gift he sent you in Bethlehem, face it, friend, he's crazy about you. The second verse, this, uh, verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God sent Jesus into the world to save the world and not to condemn. That's my second point. God sent Jesus into the world not to condemn, but to save the world through him. One time a father was passing by the, the room of his son, and he noticed something was different, very unusual. Things were tidy. Things on the floor were, was picked up. The bed was, was, was um, neatly made, pillow propped up. Then he saw a letter on the pillow, which got him really concerned. So he opened the envelope, and there was a letter addressed to dad. Now, this would be a parent's nightmare, because did his son run away? He opens the letter. The letter says, Dear Dad, it is with great regret and sorrow I'm writing to you. I had to run away with my new girlfriend, because I wanted to avoid a scene with, you, if, with mom and you. 
I have been finding real passion with Stacy, and she is so nice. But I knew you would not approve of her because of her piercings and tattoos, um, her motorcycle lifestyle, and the fact that she's much older than I am. But it's not the only reason that she's pregnant. Stacy said that we will be happy. She owns a trailer in the woods, has a stack of firewood for the whole winter. We share a dream of having many more children. Don't worry, Dad. I'm 15. I know how to take care of myself. Someday, I'm sure, I, I'm sure that we will be back to visit so that you can get to know your grandchildren. Love your son, John. Then it says, P.S. Dad, none of the above is true. I'm over at Tommy's house. I just wanted to remind you that there are worse things in life than a report card that's in my desk drawer. I love you. Call me when it's safe to come home. I know that's a joke, but it illustrates a point that when we are afraid, when we're concerned about condemnation, we run away. We keep a distance from God. You see, Perfect love drives out fear. Fear has to do with condemnation and judgment. When we are still afraid, when we are still concerned whether God loves us, we struggle with fear. Perfect love drives out fear. And so for this boy, it was his poor grades. He was afraid that his dad would give him a whipping. But perfect love drives out fear. A perfect example of that is found in John chapter 8. Now, if you remember the story, there was a woman who was uh, caught in the act of adultery. That's according to the text. Now, if you examine the text, it seems like this was a setup. Okay? Where is the man? She cannot commit adultery by herself. But according to the text, she was caught in the act of adultery. She was dragged through the streets and thrown at the face of Jesus. And so the, the, the religious leaders and the people said to Jesus, what, are you, what do we do with her? According to the law of Moses, we ought to stone her. What do you say, Jesus? Now, this was a complete setup to trap Jesus. Jesus knew that. If Jesus say, stone her, this would compromise his mission to come save us because the Jewish people were not allowed to take anyone's life. Ex only the Romans had the right to execute. So if Jesus had stoned her, then he would be in trouble. But if Jesus said, just let her go, leave her alone, then they would accuse him of being a false teacher, someone who does not respect obey and honor the Old Testament because according to Moses, according to Moses in the Old Testament, when someone commits adultery, they ought to be stoned. And so they pressed Jesus. What do we do? What do you, what do you say we should do? This was a no-win situation. Well, Jesus kept writing on the ground. He kept writing and they kept pressing him. What do we do? And notice what he said. He stood up. And this, he said, he that is without sin cast the first stone. He that is without sin cast the first stone. Wait a minute. Who has the right to cast that stone, to cast judgment? Only Jesus. What did he do? Did he cast the stone? No. And then it says from the oldest to the youngest, because they realize the older they have been, the more sin they have committed, from the oldest to the youngest, they left the, they left the scene. And Jesus said to the woman, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now, leave your life of sin. There seems to be at least two lessons here. First lesson is you and I have no right to cast a stone. You and I are sinful people. Only God has the right to judge anyone. You and I, we, 
we are saved by grace alone, by the unconditional love of God. We don't deserve it, so we can't cast that stone. Only Jesus could. But instead of casting the stone, he didn't come to judge. Rather, he came to save the world through him. And so not only did he forgive her sins, but he saved her life and gave her the power to change. Go, sin no more. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The third point is God's love for us is sacrificial. It cost him everything. In the Old Testament, um, once a year, it's called a Day of Atonement. Once a year, there's a ceremony that they would bring two lambs into the temple court. Both lambs have to be without blemish. One of the lambs, they would cast lots, so one of the lambs will become the scapegoat the other one will become a sacrific- the sacrificial lamb. The one to become the scapegoat, the priest will come before this lamb and lay his hands on the lamb. He would confess the sins of the entire nation, all the sins of the, the whole year, and symbolically or, or transfer all the sins upon this poor goat. And then after the ceremony was over, someone were to walk, and take this uh, goat, is where we get our scapegoat, takes this goat, even though this goat had done nothing wrong, walk it out of the city and into the wilderness to make sure that it would not survive out there. Take it somewhere where it would not survive. And so we get the concept of scapegoat. So what that means is that God's way of redeeming us is to remove our sins. Then the the, the second goat is called the sacrificial lamb. The lamb would die for the sins of of the entire nation, which is a picture of what God had drawn up for, for how Jesus would be sacrificed. Now, Jesus was nailed on a cross outside of the city of Jerusalem, scapegoat. He didn't commit any sins, yet he was taken out of the city sin removed. On the cross, he died as a sacrificial lamb without blemish. That means not a bone in his body was broken. He sacrificed himself. He never committed a sin. He died for our sins so that we can have that relationship restored with God. And so Jesus is not just only the sacrificial lamb, but he also took our sins far away. He is both the scapegoat and a sacrificial lamb. Friends, God's love is sacrificial. If he gave you his most precious son, how much more will he not give you all things? Think about that. His most precious he gave to you. How will he not provide for you? How will he not give good things to you? Let me bring this to, the, to a close. Many years ago, there was a teenager. She was a teenager years ago. Her name was Angel Hatfield. A teenager um, just living a rebellious life. And um, to her, at, the, at that time, she thought that living a sinful life was more fun than living, living according to the Christ, Christian values. So she got pregnant. And when she got pregnant, she was trying to hide it for five months. She was suffering from a lot of guilt and shame. Um, She was raised with Christian values. Her father was a pastor. But she also knew that one day she would have to talk to them about it, her, her father. She knew. She was walking around with a lot of shame and guilt. She knew that if someone found out, they would condemn her. Well, she knew that that day would have to come, that she would have to have that conversation with her father. She thought about, you know, secretly, you know, getting the procedure done. Then all that shame would be all gone. She thought about it. But that one day, 
she had the courage and finally decided that she had to talk to her father. When she sat down with her father, her father's head was down. He hung his head. He sat there in silence. She felt his disappointment already. And then she told her what happened. Her father raised his head and looked at her with tears in his eyes, and he said, Honey, I am so disappointed. I am. And you have made poor choices which now have consequences, he continued. It won't be easy. There will be struggles and a hard path ahead of you. But I love you, and now I figure I have been given more to love. She didn't expect her father to say that. Her, the tears ran down her eyes, and she said, I am so sorry, Dad. I am so sorry. Will you forgive me, please? Of course. She didn't expect that. She didn't expect unconditional love. She expected condemnation from her father. But she, because she experienced unconditional love, it was not shame that drove her, okay? It was unconditional love that changed her. She decided to, to, she decided to make some better decisions, to turn her life around. Yes, raising a child will be a tougher path ahead, but she chose that path. And because she did, later on in her life, she was able to help many women, unwed women, who, you know, teenage, with teenage pregnancy, my dear friends in Christ, when we experience the unconditional love of God, not just from our head, but down to our heart, it changes us. Maybe there's somebody in your life that needs unconditional love. Maybe there's somebody in your family that needs a demonstration of God's unconditional love. Shame and guilt won't change people. It is the unconditional love of God that does. The last time I read about her, um, she was uh, living in uh, L.A., I think seven kids or something. Radio, she was invited as guests on, you know, to be guests on radio, sh radio shows. She had done a lot in the area of helping women. Shame didn't change her, but the unconditional love of God did. God loves you unconditionally. God sent Jesus to save you and not to condemn. God's love is sacrificial. Amen. Please join me for a word of closing prayer. Father, we thank you for your unconditional love. You demonstrate it through your son, Jesus, who became our scapegoat and our sacrificial lamb. He did nothing wrong but you gave him as a sacrifice for all of our sins so that we can be made right with you so that our relationship can be restored. As we come before you this day, Father, you know our needs and desires. You know all of us. You know our fears. You know what we're concerned about. And we ask that your perfect love will now just invade our hearts right now that we would experience the freedom of your love, that your perfect love will drive out every fear in our lives. Help us to keep you front and center as we continue to lift up our congregation into your hands, as we begin the steps of reopening. We ask for your protection. We ask for joy as we can celebrate together again. We ask for peace. And we ask that you will continue to um, continue to protect people who are not comfortable coming back yet. We thank you for hearing all of our prayers. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Please join me for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Go in peace. Amen.